The Berkeley Writers at Work series provides a forum in which renowned faculty can discuss all aspects of their scholarship, from gathering research material and crafting the framework of a piece of writing to revising and editing their research. Research and teaching are two of the primary goals of a large and distinguished public university such as Berkeley. Yet, curiously enough, we most often are provided with the products of our faculty's research activities rather than attending to the processes involved in how this research is presented to us as acts of composition. The Berkeley Writers at Work series provides intellectual access to the distinctive processes that stand behind the significant research produced on this campus. Writing is the primary way our faculty convey the results of their research, so understanding the processes as well as the compositional issues that these writers face when they make research public is itself an important contribution to the scholarly enterprise. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on this rainy and windswept afternoon to what I'm confident will be a pleasant and informative conversation. And I'd like now to introduce Professor Glenda Hull, who is the director of the college writing programs. Professor Hull will present our distinguished speaker. Hello and welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the participants um, of the hour. First is Jane Jones, a lecturer and teacher of writing here at Berkeley. Uh, Jane, Jane has been a teacher here for, I think, about 13 years now, a writer herself. Uh, she's published poetry, fiction, and essays, and she's at work on the great American novel, um, tentatively titled Fallout or perhaps uh, Oppenheimer's Ghost. Uh, Jane currently teaches in co the college writing programs, and I'm happy to say that she's one of our program's most sought-after instructors. Jane will be uh, interviewing our featured writer and professor today, Nancy Shepper hughes Nancy is professor of anthropology here at Berkeley. She is one of our nation's foremost anthropologists. She received her BA and her PhD from Berkeley, and she's written extensively and lectured throughout the world on a range of topics, such as AIDS and human rights in Cuba, popular justice and human rights in a South African squatter camp, and maternal thinking and the policies of war. Among the places at which she has been invited to speak or teach are universities in Canada, South Africa, Brazil, Israel, Hong Kong, and France. She's conducted ethnographic field work in Brazil, Ireland, Cuba, South Africa, and New Mexico. She writes on um, a range of subjects, gender and reproduction, violence and everyday life, the practice of anthropology, and, de and deviance, madness, and social control. And she writes a lot. <laughs> She's published, I think, about 80 or 90 research articles, several books and edited volumes, some of which I think we have available here today from the ASUC for you to uh, peruse or purchase. Her book, Saints, Scholars, and Schizophrenics, Mental Illness in Rural Ireland won the Margaret Mead Award from the Society for Anthrop Applied Anthropology and the American Anthropological Association. Uh, in her book, Death with Without Weeping, The Violence of Everyday Life in Brazil, uh, Shepard Hughes examines how the extreme poverty and hunger in northeast Brazil have created a culture in which mothers not only do not mourn the, the death of sickly babies, but in fact have developed behaviors that hasten the death of those children. Commonweal calls this a, quote, searing treatment of how social and economic injustice has created forces that deprive mothers of what would seem to be the most basic of human rights, the right to, to grieve for their dead babies. Library Journal says, what makes this book as exciting to read as a good novel is her long-term interaction with a group of people that she clearly loves and the complete lack of the sense of the other that is so often found in anthropological writing. Um, this book won a number of awards and was nominated um, for the National Book Critics Circle Award for the best book of nonfiction in 1993. Well, in addition to a heavy schedule of scholarly writing, it's noteworthy, I think, that Nancy Shepard Hughes has also maintained a parallel commitment to writing for the public uh, in venues such as the Natural History Magazine, the British Magazine, the New Internationalist, editorials in the New York Times and the LA Times. And <clears throat> in these public uh, venues, she's written on subjects ranging from the cultural politics of international adoption to the assassination of Brazil's street kids to the trial of the slain American student Amy Beale and the increasing commercialization of human organs and living donors in transplant surgery. Well, in addition to her work as a professor and her research and her academic writing and her writing for wider audiences, 
<clears throat> she also has a history of public service. You can hear her speak on public radio and television about various social and political issues. She is an advocate for the mentally ill homeless in Berkeley and San Francisco. This public service began early. Uh, she was part of the civil rights movement in the 60s, doing work with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Selma, Alabama. She was also a Peace Corps volunteer. Nancy, Nancy Shepherd Hughes is working on three new books at the moment. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> One with the apt title that I admire, and I think that sums up something of her approach to her work. Here's the title, Stepping into the Accident, Notes of a Militant Anthropologist. Please welcome militant anthropologist, public intellectual, and great writer, Nancy Shepherd Hughes. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. It's um, a little bit embarrassing to uh, write about or talk about one's writing process, and I think a great metaphor for this is that my pants were falling down when I came in here. <laughs> my zipper broke. <laughs> and I think that uh, that's what really is at the heart of writing, is the uh, ability to be exposed. And uh, <laughs> so I assume there'll be some exposing here. Um, I guess. I'm supposed to read a couple of things, but uh, maybe uh, just, you know, lecturers, we lecture all the time. Uh, maybe just a word or two about ethnographic writing, because I think it was only in the last 10 years or so that we became, as anthropologists, sensitive or self-consciously aware of the fact that we were writers. I think that we thought we were um, scientists who wrote scientific reports, uh, that we were naturalists of the human condition and recorders. But in fact, ever since, um, uh, James Gifford, uh, Clifford and, and George Marcus uh, published a, a book, Writing Culture, and then Clifford Geertz followed it up with Works and Lives, we began to realize that in fact we were authors, we were writers, that we drew on a variety of, of genres, that some of us were travel and adventure writers, they were sort of Frank Buck, bring them back alive type writers, some wrote long critical reflexive essays, Malinowski on culture change, some wrote moral philosophical reflections, that you find some of this, among other things, in Tris Tropique. And some anthropologists wrote very popular and important self-help books. And I consider Margaret Mead one of those self-help writers, because she thought that uh, if we could know something about what it was like to uh, come of age in New Guinea or Samoa, we might uh, use that to transform ourselves. And uh, the other thing is that we tend to have a style, a signature, um, uh, so that um, we're, we're recognizable in, in our writings. We have a writer's identity. Uh, we have our Flaubert's, we have our Faulkner's, we have our Melville's, we have our Jean Genet's, our Camus and James Joyce's. We probably have our Mickey Spillane's too, but I'd rather not talk about them. Some write with a kind of ethnographic realism, uh, the kind of blinding clarity that one finds in Evans Pritchard's The Newer. Some write a murky sort of new age ethnographic surrealist uh, texts like, uh, like McTausick, for example, who's even invented a persona for himself, a fictional character in his latest book, uh, The Magic of the, of the State. Some, fortunately or not, write diaries like Malinowski's self-obsessed, hypochondriacal reflections on relations to the other. So all of us use a variety of literary devices and techniques, and maybe we could talk about some of those uh, in the questioning. So now I get down to business. Huh? <laughs> I won't read from all of these, so don't worry. <laughs> but I think that, you know, there's a few points uh, I could make perhaps by very briefly reading. You know, ethnography uh, or ethnographic writing uh, is in part storytelling. And so at the heart of a lot of our writing is hopefully some good stories. And because uh, we bring people to places where they haven't been before, setting is terribly important. Um, so. Uh, Here's the very brief uh, opening of chapter three from Saint Scholars and Schizophrenics, where I try to state the problem and give you a sense of the setting in which it takes place. On a, giving, on a given census day in 1971, two out of every hundred males in Western Ireland were in a mental hospital. Nearly all, nearly all of these hospitalized men were lifelong celibates, most between the ages of 35 and 50, and more than half were diagnosed as suffering from schizophrenia. On a given research day in 1975 in the tiny parish of Ballybran in southwest Kerry, 
Almost 5% of the population of 461 people were receiving psychiatric care or medication as inpatients at the county mental hospital or outpatients at the psychiatric clinic in Dingle. Two-thirds of these were men and all but one was single. And on any dar given dark winter's night when the rest of the parish has long been asleep, one can pass by the ancient stone cowhouse of Michael O'Brien and hear the old saint milking and talking to his cows or merely stand in the night with them while reciting several decades of the rosary. But Misha, my God, what harm? Michael, the old recluse, is a saint and he serves his cows the way he once served his mother, God rest her soul. Or taking the rocky Bohorin path that separates the Finn pasture from the O'Neills, one might encounter Holy Marae dressed in vibrant reds and greens on her way to a mass long since over. She'll stop you and hold you fast until she has been able to get it right, her loose, broken, diffuse genealogy, counting the names and numbers of people long since dead or gone away, and groping for her place among the shadows. Maraid asks you again, has Jimmy Tui come home yet? Then finally, as you turn up the winding mountain road to Bali Bran, you might run into old Ned, who will startle at the still unfamiliar sound of a car motor and will stalk the machine as the proverbial angry bull stalks a red shirt. No, no, he will not let you pass the public road. Not today. Mentally an illness, both treated and untreated, is uncommonly common in the land of saints and scholars. Um, so uh, the other point, I guess, I could make among several is that ethnography is also um, a kind of autobiography. Um, I can't remember whether it was Levi-Strauss or Geertz who referred to it as knowledge of the self through the detour of the other. And I think throughout much of our writing there uh, is a sense to um, relate our own lives uh, to the particular problems that we've chosen to um, study. So here is how I open Death Without Weeping. The prologue is called Sugar House. There was, however, improbably, oh, actually, there's a subtitle called Connections. There was, however, improbably, an artist living on our block on South Third Street in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. He inhabited a basement apartment, the kind below street level, with iron bars across the windows, so that when one looked out, all that could be seen were amputated legs and feet scurrying across pavement. How he painted in that dark, dank, cold water flat, I'll never know but it obviously required great powers of imagination. We didn't have a clue that the funny little man, Morris Kish was his name, was anything at all until he invited several neighbors to a showing in his flat. We children sat together in the front on straight back kitchen chairs, half expecting we would have to suppress giggles, then gales of laughter. For what could Morris Kish ever think to paint? Morris Kish could think to paint a great deal indeed, and I remember being lost in a swirl of colors and vivid impressions and impish magic as he showed us what we never thought to see in the rundown workaday world of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. There was the bridge, of course, but a bridge teeming with humanity crossing and recross crossing, bundled in long coats and sweaters, each face revealing a different story. There was the Saints Peter and Paul's Church Carnival, but not the dowdy one with dull paint-chipped carousel horses and abusive carnies that we knew, but rather the carnival when just before dawn and after the crowds had left, the horses came alive and danced and played cards. <coughs> But what I remember most of all in those huge surprise canvases were the men of Berry Streets and South First and South Second rushing and converging together on the front uh, gates of the black monster that dominated our landscape, the Domino Sugar Refining Factory, which we knew only as the Sugar House. Those of us who grew up at the foot of the factory, adults and children, workers and not, all responded to the movements of the beast. We woke to its shrill whistles, its humming and clangings were a permanent backdrop to our conversations. We breathed its foul fumes, and finally we went to bed to the comforting sound of foghorns guiding ships and their precious cargo to its docks. This book takes me full circle from childhood to midlife, for it is, I think, no coincidence that my anthropology finally brought me home to northeast Brazil and to those verdant but cloying fields of sugarcane to work with people who invariably describe themselves as having grown up at the foot of the cane. Foot of the factory, foot of the cane, we are all implicated as workers and consumers in the, in the vicious sugar cycle and in the miseria morta, the deadly misery it leaves in its wake. As a child of the Williamsburg, Eastern European, later Puerto Rican slum, I was marked by the image of the sugar house and in writing about the cane cutters and their families of Bon Jesus de Mata, I'm also trying to reach out and touch the fading images of those sugar workers I knew as a child and whose faces I remember, but only as it turns out, 
in the vivid and impressionistic paintings of Morris Kish. Um, well, um, if I had time, I would uh, read some more from this rather long book, including <laughs> some of the scenes of early trauma, because uh, when I say that anthropological writing is autobi autobiographical, I mean that often you are working out uh, some issues of, of trauma. Uh, you observe something and perhaps it reminds you of something in your own life and it was the, the scenes of um, conformity to the death of children in a people who were otherwise so incredibly vibrant and emotional. It was the lack of emotion where I thought emotion should be. And of course we're not supposed to think what should happen with people but we do sometimes get surprised and shocked by things. And if I hadn't, I think, been so traumatized by some of the scenes of infant death that I see, had seen in the early 60s, I would never have gone back 16 years later for five more research trips uh, to try to understand uh, the emotions that, uh, that was so confusing to me the first time I went. So uh, one of the problems about writing is uh, you know, getting started, and the other problem about writing is uh, finishing. And so uh, <laughs> I might tell you that uh, I had a very hard time finishing this book, and in fact, 100 pages were cut right on the floor from this, from the original, uh, so that it could fit between the covers of the book. Um, but I thought that uh, you might want to know that I, uh, I also can write short pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked in my files, and this is the shortest piece I ever wrote. It's a little bit off color because it's called The Male Discovery of the Clitoris, so I call it my shortest piece. Um, <laughs> and actually, it's um, a response to uh, both feminist anthropologists and to so-called critical medical anthropologists who kept writing obsessively about female genital surgery in Africa and kept condemning it and calling for an end to it and whatever. And it struck me as very unanthropological to take such a strong moralistic stance. And so I thought, how will I respond to this? And uh, so I won't read, I'll just read a tiny bit. Uh, I don't like the idea of clitoridectomy any better than any other women I know, but I like even less the Western voices of reason on this topic coming from applied medical anthropologists and feminists, male or female. In the long run, as Yomo Kenyatta warned in 1938 with reference to the colonial Christian opposition to the traditional practice of female circumcision in Kenya, the attention given to the subject by outsiders, even the most balanced and well-intentioned ones, may do more harm than good. Oh, besides, those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Why is the body in question always the female body? Uh, why don't we turn our attention to the practice of genital surgery as it exists in the neonatal units of our cosmopolitan hospitals in the United States? It is, by and large, a ritual practice foisted by fathers on their infant sons. So I'll end with an ethnographic, though personal, anecdote. On January 6, 1974, the traditional Roman Catholic feast of the Three Kings, my baby son Nathaniel was circumcised in the Berkeley Clinic of an elderly folksy GP who had circumcised his own sons and grandsons, he told us. Nathaniel was circumcised against my will and after a lengthy disagreement with my husband. I refused to allow it to happen in hospital. Our pediatrician looked away when I asked him for the medical justification for the genital mutilation. He said there was some evidence related to surgical cancers, but that he himself found the studies not so convincing, cancers in the wives of the men or partners of the men. Moreover, uh, he added, well, as a man of medicine, I really have nothing to say. Circumcision is a ritual practice, and it's a very personal decision. He certainly preferred not to get involved, but he did give us the name of this old-fashioned practitioner who would perform the surgery without risk of anesthesia. My husband carried our last born and firmly swaddled child into the clinic surgery. When I saw the implements to be used, I grew faint and was asked to leave the three kings, grandfatherly doctor, young father, and man-child alone to perform their ritual duty among themselves and without censure. In the waiting room, I could hear my infant son's amazed and outraged shrieks until finally he held his breath so long I resigned myself to his death. He survived, of course, and today, this was several years ago, he is a big, strapling, healthy 17-year-old, but I still believe that my son was sexually mutilated and violated as an infant, and as a consequence that some part of his adult sexual pleasure was forever denied him. 
Where then are the pa passionate voices of our Western male or female medical anthropologists and feminists, some of them circumcised, some of them not, speaking out on the practice of male genital surgery in the United States? Why isn't male circumcision another one of those places, to cite someone else who is opposed to female circumcision, where we ought to draw the line? Um, okay, I think I have some other passages I could read, but I want us to get involved. I, I guess a couple of other points that maybe will come out in the discussion, and I was going to read briefly, uh, that anthro uh, ethnography, ethnographic writing, is about rule breaking, and it necessarily pisses people off. <laughs> I don't think there's been a place that I've been that I haven't pissed people off. And um, if I don't, I'm worried that perhaps I'm just feeding people back what they would like to hear in terms of common sense interpretations. So I don't intentionally try to do that, but I feel that, um, that what we do is, uh, in part, we're revealing as outsiders public secrets, things that everybody in the community knows, but around which there's a complicity of silence. For example, that Irish wasn't really spoken in the Gale talked that alcoholism was rampant during the winter months in West Kerry, that sexual relations were fraught with anxiety in the village marriages, or that in Brazil some shantytown mothers contributed to the deaths of their infants that they saw as having no taste or no knack for life. Again in Brazil, that stopping the AIDS epidemic might need something more than condom literacy, especially when one was dealing with marginalized and sexually exploited groups, for example, street kids, transvestite prostitutes, and poor women with husbands who had sexually fluid sexual patterns. Um, so if um, uh, the Irish villagers said, or one or two, that this woman should be shot, I've had that same response uh, with respect to what I had to say about AIDS in Cuba and AIDS in Brazil when I was going to read you a piece, but I won't, when I visited a transvestite uh, brothel, to use an old-fashioned term, that had turned into a hospice and uh, to really reflect on why there were so many transvestites um, who were suffering with AIDS and uh, for reasons for which condom literacy was not really going to, to help them very much. But maybe, I'm sorry, maybe um, I will read one tiny piece because it'll put you in preparation for tonight. I hope some of you will come to hear Albie Sachs, the great South African warrior come uh, speak about violence and recovery in South Africa because we're not only there to piss people off. I think some of what anthropological and ethnographic writing is about is what I call praise singing. That is in the traditional warrior, koza, and Zulu tradition to sing the praises of people as well. And so uh, in an article um, on my, that's drawn from my new book, Who's the Killer? Uh, it's the chapter called The Last White Christmas. But it's prefaced by uh, some notes from my, from my field notes, and it's about violence in South Africa and about people who survived violence in the anti-apartheid struggle. You cannot avoid them, for they're present at every political event. Father Michael Lapsley with his startling metal hooks where his hands should be. There he is, mischievously lighting an attractive woman's cigarette. Oh, it's a magician's trick. Or over there, skillfully holding the stem of a wine glass raised in a defiant toast. Or he's right behind you, scratching with his hook on your upper arm to get your attention. Notice me, his hook hand seems to be saying, but playfully. And once the shock wears away, one wants to caress his gentle hook hand to stroke the ruptured, permanently discolored skin where his right eye once was, and to toast him, noble ANC wounded warrior, with wine goblets held raised high, clinking glass with metal and champagne with tears. <coughs> And over there, with his back carelessly turned to the door, stands Albie Sachs with his deeply lined face and his resonant, soothing voice, the agnostics theologian dressed in his briefly robes, his favorite bright and bold dashiki, waving his missing arm, his phantom limb. That ever-present missing piece is Albie's most expressive body part, and he gestures and speaks forcefully with the waving empty sleeve, his sweet banner of liberty of thee I sing, Albie. So I'll end there.
Well, as you were talking about your writing before you got ready to read, you raised all kinds of questions, some that I had thought of before. And maybe you can just elaborate a little bit on one that has to do with um, the self in ethnography. And that is how you manage to, um, to maintain a sort of critical perspective, but also stay close to the people and the issues that are important to you and that you write about. I mean, is there some kind of juggling that goes on in the writing process and the way you express? Well, I guess uh, I think of anthropology as a kind of a cultural jiu-jitsu in the sense that it is off-centered, off-balancing, and hopefully uh, off-centering to you, yourself. So while I went to Brazil, for example, with a notion of trying to understand uh, what maternal thinking and practice mm -hmm. was like in a situation of extreme poverty and hunger, um, I was also uh, transformed by the experience. And you don't hang on, of course, you know, as a, we are still empirical workers. And so some of my original hypotheses, you know, of course, had to be discarded and I had to be opened up to uh, what I hope was a, a deeper, richer, more complex understanding that um, at the one and the same time might be telling people something that they were not quite ready to say about themselves. So in that mm -hmm. sense, it's critical. And yet, I've always said that we shouldn't keep our writing secret. That is, I shouldn't be thinking and saying these things about mother and child relations without feeding it back and having a conversation, and to do it as gently as possible. And so um, I was always part of a, uh, an association of moradores, of squatter settlement people who over various points in time, over the 30 years now that I've been in contact, at times they were oriented to Paulo Freire and type critical mm -hmm. consciousness, at times influenced by um, liberation theology. They were people who were as complex psychologically and as uh, intellectualizing as we are. In fact, in political terms, even though illiterate, more than we are. And so uh, I could launch my questions about what was happening. And I could share with people, mm -hmm. you know, what, what I thought was happening. And they would correct me. They would accept. They would reject. But my main feeling is that you can still hang on to a thesis that perhaps 80% of the people in the community wouldn't accept. They did accept the thesis about child death and maternal uh, behavior. What they didn't accept was my thesis about uh, hunger hiding as doenza di nervos. Mm -hmm. And they argued profoundly with that argument that comes out in chapter five and six. They really wanted to believe that what they were suffering <coughs> from was a psychological ailment, right. which it was, of course, in part. We don't separate. But um, I feel that in the end, what you might say would, would maybe could be disagreed, could be argued, could be contested, but it shouldn't strike people as totally alien. There should be some resonance. That is, there has to be a certain amount of shared discourse between you and the people you study. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that has to come you know, both ways. And one has to, I, I, don't, I don't strive to have affection for the people that I work with. I choose people to work with for whom I feel a natural affection. And I pretty much uh, stay away from, um, uh, from people in groups for whom I feel I would just present them as, as utter stereotypes, for example. Um. When in um, the introduction to Death Without Weeping, you uh, talk about the fact that it can be read at mutually interfering levels. And you name some of those, a book of voyage and discovery, moral reflection on a human society forced to the margins as a political text or as a Christian passion play that indicts a political economic order that reproduces sickness and death at its very base. And so as a reader, mainly because Death Without Weeping is a long, complex book, mm -hmm. I, can, I feel that I can negotiate those interfering mm -hmm. levels mm -hmm. fairly well. What I was wondering about was how you write at mutually interfering levels. I assume if what is written comes out that way, that there's some <coughs> process of dealing with material that's you know. Well, I think that there's both conscious and unconscious processes that take place in writing. And um, uh, you, know, you might be writing a chapter that you think is a straightforward thesis about 
um, the political economy of hunger, and all of a sudden certain theological preoccupations <laughs> start coming up. And so rather than suppressing them, I tend to allow those to bubble up and to try to integrate them. I, I tend to be an extremely, um, I don't know, the term bricolage is overused a lot, but I, maybe a weaver. I mm -hmm. tend to take whatever is at hand uh, and to try to weave it together, even if um, you know, it, it makes a bit of a patchwork quilt of a book with these texts and subtexts and uh, asides, sometimes humorous asides. Um, some of the uh, interference also comes from the fact that I tend to write, although writing is obviously a solitary uh, task, you just have to be alone, uh, but I'm always writing to individuals. Uh, and uh, uh, I just, in fact, if I can find it, um, I generally have photos in front of me when I write. And so depending on, and maybe this is the vestige of my Catholic education, they're like little <laughs> relics. <laughs> and um, so, for example, let me see. Um, in the rain, if it hasn't destroyed me. Uh, my favorite informant, Bew, who's taken mm -hmm. out her, her false <laughs> teeth, the playful side of Bew you know, trying to amuse her sometimes. Or, um, you know, some of my favorite street kids will be out there. Or a um, uh, picture of the local priest, and I'll be then arguing with uh, aspects of Catholicism. And uh, among the people I've pissed off was uh, the Archbishop of New York with an article that I wrote in uh, Natural History magazine that um, involved even liberation theology in the high rates of infant mortality, because although liberation theology uh, transformed people at so many levels, it just couldn't deal with the body, with sexuality, with homosexuality, with abortion, with all of those embodied issues. And because liberation theology couldn't deal with it, I felt that women, Catholic women that I worked with for the most part, were really caught in a terrible, terrible double bind. That is, on the one hand, they gave birth because they sort of felt, at least in part, some of the older women, that it was their duty to give birth, there was a duty to reproduce, but they didn't feel that there was a duty to raise all of these babies because some of these were just given birth to give to Mary or to Jesus or to give to whatever the saints were. And so therefore they could feel slightly happy about the fact that a child named after a particular saint was going to Maria do Carmel, for example. Liberation theology comes along and starts telling people, but Jesus doesn't want all these babies, doesn't want these babies to die. He's not a, some Baroque god or cannibal god that wants to eat your children. He wants them all to live. And the women are kind of confused because they can't have, you know, the traditional comfort that Catholicism gave. And at the same time, they don't really have the wherewithal to be able to control the births. And so I said that it was in this horrible... Uh, contradiction that so much misery was born and I felt that the church was in, at least in part big surprise you know responsible for it well natural history magazine wanted me wa wa not, they didn't want me they supported me but the archbishop's office demanded an apology from the, Na the Museum of Natural History from the editor from me and to my and be, I was really quaking in my boots because they sent me all of these letters and articles and uh, from different people in the office, and I thought, well, I mean, I have Natural History Magazine and the museum, I don't want to besmirch their, you know, reputation. It's an institution I love. I grew up with it in New York City. And they were teasing me a bit. Both the, the editor and the uh, sous chef there both had Irish names. <laughs> and uh, they said, we just love giving it to the Archbishop. <laughs> and of course, we're, we don't want an apology. Of course, we'll stand by you. And they even invited me to write another piece, and in fact, <laughs> I'm writing a piece for them now on, uh, on the sale of human organs. And so, in terms of who I write for and the ambiguity, sometimes I write to the Pope. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, you know, and, and in fact, I had a dream uh, when I almost finished Death Without Weeping uh, that Pope John Paul was in a crowd and turned around, and I very nervously handed him my book, and he took it, he smiled, and he blessed me. <laughs> and I thought, well, of course, this is a dream and a fantasy. But I think I wanted, uh, even though I'm an ex-alienated Catholic, I am not anti-religion, and I so much want the church to come, to come around. I so much want writing to move 
those people who have so much control over other people's lives. So it's not always written with hostility, uh, sometimes with humor. And, uh, but uh, I also write, too, if I brought it, because it was on my desk, and I thought I might be asked about how I write or where I write. or thought, I'll ask you that while you're looking. Well, that's my bathing suit. No, that's <laughs> <laughs> I do write when I swim. It's real important. <laughs> yeah, this is my little icon. He's a little naked devil. And I, I keep him in front of me, sticking his tongue out, because, you know, uh, you have to have a sense of humor about writing. Mm -hmm. And also because you write with your angels, but you write with your devils, too. And, you know, you'd be lost if you got rid of all those devils, because they, they really, they help you. They, they give you your passion. And uh, so it's bringing the angels and the devils together in your writing that I think is important. And also, as I said, having a sense of humor and getting down to the embodied aspects of life. <laughs> and so this little guy sort of represents a lot in terms of my writing process. <laughs> Um, you mentioned in your introduction that you had left a hundred pages of Death Without Weeping on the floor. On the floor. Mm -hmm. And I have always been fascinated by the very last words uh, of this book. Yeah. They follow the um, photographs. Maybe one of them is even of the woman you just mentioned. Anyway, <clears throat> the last words before you get to the notes and that sort of thing are, um, like Dilsey, they endured. And somehow when I read that, it really just talk about resonance, and I thought, oh, Dilsey, you know, I mean, where does she come into this? And then I really had to kind of start rethinking, you know, Faulkner, and um, I was, I wanted to know what you were thinking that your reader would know or think with those words as the closing words of your Was it really book. the closing words? Well, they're the Pretty last close, words, <laughs> other than, you know, I think they come before I your notes. Or yeah, right well, I suppose notes. that, um, those uh, references to, to literature and reading just pop out at you. And uh, I probably assume that you write at different levels and different people will understand what you're getting at. And I don't assume that everybody, you know, has read uh, The Sound and the Fury or, you know, Absalom, Absalom or whatever, but that quite a few will have. And perhaps for them, that, that line uh, of Faulkner's uh, with the sort of power of, of, of those characters who were so poor and yet had uh, exemplified this enormous sense of resilience, which to me was what I was trying to get across about um, uh, the women, especially, and children of the Alta de Cruzeiro. I think the hardest chapter to write, well, there were two that were incredibly hard for me to write. A lot of the book kind of wrote itself, I have to say, wrote pretty, pretty quickly over a long period of time, but picking it up. But for some reason, the middle, the dead center of that book, chapter six, when it was the transition to the second half, uh, which was about bodies, death, and silence, I, I really banged my head against the wall. I, I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't get it out. And I realized why, because I was writing around a topic that was filled mm -hmm. with silence. It was the topic that people couldn't really talk about. I had to almost intuit a lot of it and put together things that weren't so much said as unsaid. And yet I was sure that my thesis was correct, but I didn't know how to articulate it because I rely so much on what people tell me and what I hear. And here, people were speaking in sign language about how their bodies were so um, uh, preyed upon and so insecure. So that, but the last chapter, and this will get us back to Dilsey, was very hard because the last chapter, which I mean, unfortunately named De Profundis, Out of the Depths, was exactly that. How do I get us out now? This is a, in a way, it is a profoundly sad book, but I hope that my own sense of optimism is, 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 is there as well. But I didn't want to fall into any of the easy traps of the day when I was writing. All the tropes about resistance and, you know, everything becomes resistance and uh, so that I, I would be the de rigueur chapter to write would be how these people were, these women were all sort of mini Joan of Arcs and they were struggling and fighting and, and it wasn't true to them. And in fact, you know, how, so in the, the, the opening uh, line of De Profundis, I can remember this because it was a family joke. They endure and they get by, the women of, and men of the Alto, making do as best they can relying on their wits, playing the odds, engaging in the occasional malandraging of deceit and white lies, gossip and rumor, feigned loyalty, th uh, th theft and trickery. And I got stuck. I couldn't get beyond that because 
and I kept rewriting that same, they get by, they endure, they get by, but what more, how do they resist, you know? And, and, and how, how can I convince people that they're good people, even though they didn't make a major revolution? <laughs> we all want, we're playing at our own infantile, adolescent, 1960s fantasies that we want everybody to be a revolutionary. These people who I loved probably more than any other group of people on the face of the earth were not revolutionaries. And so I finally had to accept that it was existence, you know, not resistance that their life was about. And that could I sing praises to people who did what was necessary in order to survive, in order to exist, without making them into some sort of Albie Sachs, for example, <laughs> which, which they were not. And uh, so that's, and so ending, I guess, then with Dilsey is say, can't you see that there's a beauty and a power and something wondrous in people who will survive, even though sometimes they use some methods to survive that wouldn't be considered absolutely noble from the perspective of a comfortable, well-fed person sitting in their chair at home. Okay. A long way to get back to Dilsey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, from Dilsey to Margaret Mead. Uh, <laughs> the Margaret Mead Award is given um, in recognition of a work that interprets anthropological data and principles in ways that make them meaningful to a broadly concerned public. And you've explained a little bit who you write to, who's in front of you when you're writing. But I was wondering if you could um, tell us who else beside the people <coughs> you're writing about and the Pope, mm -hmm. um, who you see <laughs> as your readers, your reading public? Well, uh, there's that uh, trope that's the, the, the New Yorker uh, reader who's this sort of, um, you know, woman that uh, is, uh, probably lives on the Upper West Side of New York and is probably a good liberal progressive who buys books and is engaged and, um, I mean, that's one population I sort of aim for, the reading general public, people who are in, engaged with ideas, who you would maybe meet at Black Oak Bookstore sitting there, you know, uh, who, who care about literature and writing. But uh, I have some other conceits, I guess. I, I, I like to uh, feel that I, that I reach out even broader than that. And some of my the moments when I felt most um, happy, I think, as a writer is when I'll get a letter from, for example, a couple of years ago, um, a letter from a bachelor farmer who said it took him over 10 years to screw up the courage to write to me about St. Scholars and Schizophrenics <laughs> because it was so painful what he saw and yet he wanted me to know that while well, at first he was so angry at what I had to say that in the end he felt that it was okay for him to be the way he was. It wasn't his fault. So I think my book allowed him to see a little bit of what used to be called the sociological imagination, that it's not just you alone in isolation that has this particular problem because there's something wrong with your head, your cuckoo or whatever. There's a social context. There's a historical context. There are um, social forces that uh, don't determine you but that shape what you can know and what you can feel and what you can experience. And uh, the fact that this man who, you know, had the grass of several cows and lived alone in the middle of um, Ireland would somehow, you know, feel that there was something in the book for him, that pleased me. And of course, uh, those are also the population that I'd like to reach. I know that Hortense Powdermaker, who was my mentor, who was a very accessible anthropological writer trained under Malinowski in England, and uh, did one of the first anthropological studies in the United States after doing very traditional work in Les Sioux. And then she went to the South and studied um, the race caste system there in the 1930s. And then went to Hollywood and did a study of Hollywood and making of movies before she went to um, uh, Southern Africa to study the effect of um, media on labor unions, of all things, and work. But um, she once told me that and I understood this completely, that the most pleased that she had ever been was when um, a hairdresser who she didn't know when she walked in to get her hair cut somewhere in Manhattan recognized the name Powdermaker and said, are you the one that wrote that book on? And I can't remember which book it was. And Hortense was just so pleased that this hairdresser, you know, had somehow read her work. So I think that um, 
you know, if one is a writer, you want to communicate with as broadly uh, as possible. Although sometimes we get into our arcane arguments with one particular group of anthropologists or specialists in a field, or I'm arguing with psychiatrists about the diagnosis of schizophrenia, or sometimes, um, you know, arguing with medical doctors about um, psychosomatic ills and their meaning and so forth. So sometimes you are thinking of very specific audiences, but this part of us, I think, that wants to have as many people read it and respond as possible. When there was such a uproar about saint scholars and schizophrenics, you um, offered to not accept the Margaret Mead Award, <laughs> and you asked a village <laughs> elder if it was okay if you did. Um, accept it, and he said yes, it was okay. What would it have meant to you professionally and personally not to have accepted that award? Well, actually, uh, let me make it a leave even a little more firm. I think that um, not only was I worried uh, about, because I think it was only the second time the award had been given, and again, it was like that feeling of not wanting to cast any you know, shadows on this award, which was meant to honor an anthropologist who I respected very, very much. There was actually a discussion at the meeting. Uh, the award was given at the Society for Applied Anthropological Meetings, which was held that year for some reason in Scotland. And that's why they paid my way to get the award. I went to Ireland, and it was there that I really found out, you know, how upset people were and um, how the New York, uh, not the New York Times, the Irish Times had published several articles about it. I still have them. Geared for a gale. The yank in the corner, that's me. You know? <laughs> Watch out for anthropologists. They'll grab the secrets of your soul. And not with the camera, with their ears, you know. And um, so, I, uh, but at the village, one of the leaders in the village, uh, the schoolmaster said, no, no, go ahead. He said, you know, take it, but explain what you learned from coming back here. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, you're a writer. And he said, I, I hope he's right still. He said, you've got a few more books in you yet, <laughs> but I want you to learn from us about this experience. You know, be careful about what you say about other people, about the secrets that you tell. Even though I claim, you know, in my response, the reply to Bally Brand, which I published in the Irish Times, Bally Brand was, of course, the pseudonym, um, I, I explained, and maybe it was a weak defense, that I was dealing with public secrets and that many things were given to me in confidence, which, of course, I would never have personal secrets about people because you do get very close to people. That would not be part of the book. But if I was going to write about the fact that, well, in fact, to tell you the truth, Irish really wasn't spoken in the community, um, even though that was a painful truth, to a community that saw itself as, as Gaeltacht, as Irish speaking, I sort of felt that as a sociologist, anthropologist, I had to write about that. Uh, but when I went to Scotland to get the award, Peter Kongmi knew, the late Peter Kongmi knew, who's again an anthropologist I absolutely revered, was in a real dither. He didn't know whether he should give the award because by now the controversy had become, you know, pretty public. But um, but he talked to the group and all, and they said, no, no, we're going to go ahead because, in fact, the award recognizes that we're not sanctioning every word that you had to say, but the fact that this translates anthropological concepts to a broadly concerned public, and God knows <laughs> you certainly got the attention of a broadly concerned public. But um, I am intending to go back to, after all these years, to Clahan, which is the name of the community, if anybody wants to go, they're known to everyone now. Uh, just about every villager has a copy of the book, I'm told. And now, of course, with time, things shake down. And what seemed so shocking then to people, not so much, I mean, personal names and what changed and biographies were shifted so that they shouldn't really recognize themselves, you know, to each other. But I think it was the shock of being analyzed for the first mm -hmm. time by an outsider so that all of the comfortable myths that we all have about ourselves and why we do what we do and uh, the kinds of virtues that we have and the kinds of maybe um, bad traits that we have, all of a sudden are being viewed in a, in a rather different light by the outsider. 
And also, in, uh, there was, I had certain psychological uh, pretensions when I wrote that. I was somewhat of a sort of psychoanalytic anthropologist, God help me, I would never do this today. It's one of those things I've given up <coughs> utterly and completely that is trying to really uh, analyze a little bit some of the sort of subconscious things. I would never do that. I wouldn't deign to do that. Um, but they had, not, they had not been exposed to any sort of, they didn't know who Freud was. They had never heard of any of this. And the fact that I explained that there was a kind of a subliminal brother-sister incest theme that ran through the community was more than, than they were really willing to see or accept. But now it's no problem. People sort of say, oh yeah, that's there. And in fact, there's a kind of a, a call response between ethnographic writing and literary writing. And I picked up uh, a wonderful novel um, by Jeanette, I can't remember her last name, Hagen or something, called The All of It. It's a wonderful novel about Irish life, and I swear she must have read some of St. Scholars and Schizophrenics <laughs> because it, it has this theme of the brother-sister incest. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, so many of the little features of it, it reminds me of some of the things that I had written. And I've heard that Frank McCord says that, that he was influenced somewhat in writing his own autobiography by having read St. Scholars mm -hmm. and Schizophrenics, of which I'd love to meet him and find out if it's true. Someone said they heard him say that at a, at a speech somewhere. But I think that there is uh, an interplay. We borrow from, there's no doubt, from literature. But I think, because that's how I, understood something about the Irish before I went to that village. There was virtually no ethnography. It was Conrad Ahrensberg's The Irish Countryman, which was old and dated, and uh, in a very different genre of ethnographic writing, although I loved it, but it was very different than the kind of writing I was going to do in the 60s. And then there was a terrible book by John Messenger, Innisbeg. And so I had to read Irish literature. There was nothing else. How else would I know or have any sense of who the people were, but it wasn't the grand literature so much. Although I did read James Joyce and you know Yeats and so forth, but it was and sing, but it was really the autobiogra autobiographical writings that came out of the west of Kerry and the Blasket Islands, Thomas O'Crohan and Maurice O'Sullivan and and Peg Sayers and uh, the Taylor and Anstey. It was those autobiographical texts that really allowed me to sort of walk in or parachute into this tiny little mountain village where people were still driving their cows every morning to the dairy and the men were still going out on their little kuraks, so there weren't very many, their boats fishing. And there were still some shepherds driving their 20 or 30 sheep up the mountain. And uh, here I am, the girl from Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it was the literature, you see, of Ireland that allowed me to even know what questions to ask, to even know what to look for. So you have to have some preparation before you go. Well, it's one o'clock, and I know a lot of people probably have mm -hmm. classes to go to, but I also assume that there are many people out there who have questions. So if you can stay a little bit and answer some questions. I thought you were going to ask me where I write. Oh, I was, but you sort of, <laughs> then you got your bathing suit out, and I, I was distracted, so maybe Nellie, why don't you ask her where okay. she writes. Fortunately, my, my question came out quickly. Just speaking about, so, Maybe it's all right for me to start. Sure. And that is um, that I had heard many years before your book came out they, that the Irish language is in itself deeply schizophrenic. That, uh, <laughs> and I just remember hearing this when I first began uh -huh. studying Irish as a graduate student here. And uh, being saying, oh my God, what does that mean? Yeah, I'd like to know what that but, means. But, um, well, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I could talk a little bit, I'm not an authority, and, and there are people who, who can, I know, mm -hmm. on this campus talk about that more, but um, I just know my own experience of standing on the steps of the Dublin Library and asking people, um, where's the library? And finally someone said, is it a book you'd be wanting? Uh-huh. And, and this, this uh -huh. and voice is there as a language which is I deeply see. secretive that goes right. way, way, yeah. way. I mean, I don't like using schizophrenia as a metaphor. It's a, it's a, yeah, anyway, it's, 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 it's um, just, it was one of those obviously a silly and flippant remark, and yet, you know, we're all used to it. Since I yeah. just wondered what you knew about that. Well, and I, I guess, as, as a path, I wouldn't even say it's the language, well, I guess it's sort of linguistic, in a sociolinguistic <laughs> sense, but uh, I guess where that came up was in more the interactional patterns uh, of what could be said, what couldn't be said, and then this, um, what I called the uh, Ballybrand double bind, which was part of the way, I guess you could say, the, the structure of, 
of language, what, um, the way people would sort of tease each other. Uh, some of it would be in the pubs where um, you would attack someone by setting up a situation where they could not get out of it. They couldn't win, they couldn't lose. You, you know, you sort of, um, and I'm thinking of uh, the two brothers, Seamus and Podrick, who used to, old bachelors in the 50s, used to go to the pub all the time. And the games, the interactional games that were played on Podrick, who was, I think, the younger of the two, who was extremely shy of women. But they used to call him uh, the woman hater, or Casanova, or whatever. And any time a woman would walk into this pub, and very few did, it was usually me, they would make me sit next to this man. And they'd say, come on, come on, strike up a conversation, Patty. Go on, go on, you finally got her now. Work with her. And I, it was just awful. And so he would start stuttering and stammering. And then at one point, uh, you know, he actually put his head in his lapel. And everybody laughing, just having a crack, you know, giving the mickey or whatever the term was. Until finally, Padre would just run out of the pub. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't call that uh, schizophrenic, but there was something about it that uh, was reminiscent of some of the, the double binds that people got themselves into uh, because of, um, you know, the whole notion of the double bind is uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't, and uh, we won't let you get out of this alive. You've got to stay here and somehow fight it out. And there was, um, there were also, uh, you know, patterns about, um, appropriate ways of speaking and being very quick with language. So I always felt that a person who maybe had, uh, you know, some linguistic problems maybe being not schizophrenic, but <coughs> not exactly as witty as would, would be expectable, or expected, would be readily labeled in this kind of a society because the repartee of language was so important and so rich. And so I think that some of the, the older bachelors who were shy suffered from that. Yes. There's a question. I'm sorry. Yes, I was hoping that you talk a little bit more about the process of your writing, how you go back and forth, let's say from your field notes, uh, how you edit, whether you use an editor, so more than you Oh, okay. Of the it's the details of writing. Okay. Uh, I do a lot of my writing in the field, actually. And uh, in fact, I would say that the one thing that's really uh, I feel hurt my writing more, but I can't get myself off of it, is the, is the computer now. Uh, because the, the method of just typing up on my little Olivetti uh, Ledra 32 and snipping it and putting it in a box and uh, you know, having this little card catalog system, which was George Foster's method, was always the best. And I kind of get lost in these you know, writing. I mean, I'm not, I'm not very, I'm a technophobe, and so I only do word processing. And, uh, I find it a lot harder to retrieve my, my notes. Uh, both you write too much and you write too randomly. It's not as painful as writing with this damn typewriter where the letters get stuck. Also, I'm a two-finger typist. And so, <laughs> you know, I really look stupid on the computer, but that's, that's how I type. But somehow, um, a lot of the writing gets done in the field. And uh, it goes from, I, um, I take notes. I always carry a little notebook. I look like one of those awful, you know, journalists with a pad. Uh, sometimes I write on my hand if it's not appropriate to have a piece of paper. Uh, I have various mnemonic devices. I have a terrible memory for things I'm not too interested in, like <coughs> bureaucratic things. But I have a powerful memory when it comes to re re recording almost verbatim a conversation of an hour that I've had with someone in their house, where it would be absolutely horrible for me to be taking notes, but I have to retrieve it immediately. And so at times, uh, I've run into everything from an outhouse to uh, just behind a fence, you know, to write it, write it, write it really quickly. But I would, you know, have keywords so that I would say, okay, this 15-minute conversation was on this, this was on this, and so I'd have those 10 keywords and with this, the keywords. But that gets to the question of the veracity of what we write. Most of what uh, I have recorded in both Death Without Weeping and in St. Scholars and Schizophrenics was done with, in that method. We become much, much more, especially since Jeff Mason's work and the whole New Yorker flap or the truth of every word, that I now feel obligated, and I hate it, I have thousands of transcriptions. So that, you know, not to back up my authority, but just that, well, 
maybe that's the way we have to do it. Maybe it's the best way. And so, in, and, and also in South Africa, where I'm working now, I'm, I'm recording people speaking Kosa and Zulu and Afrikaans and whatever. And some of the, some of the translation process I have to do later. I can't, you know, I don't, I don't deal with those languages. So, but anyway, writing in the field is very, very important. And in terms of editing and. Um, I like good editorial suggestions, and, and in fact, that's why I love writing for the, uh, there's, a, there's an editor, I don't know if she'd like me to mention her name, Maura Crow at The Natural History. She's extremely interactive with my work, and so, so are the editors at, at New Internationalist. And, uh, and I take their suggestions, and I like it. Now, with my books, that was sort of a different question. Copy editing, but I don't like much more than that. I don't know why. Somehow with the books, it was different. But when it came to the process of having to cut Death Without Weeping, the press hired an outside editor to cut, and they assured me it was someone who had a great sensitivity for writing and whatever uh, person may be in the audience. In fact, I'm sure he's a wonderful writer. But I was so outraged by what was going to be cut from the book, like the whole chapter on, on Carnival, which was essential to my thesis, that I, I sat down and I cut word by word myself. Because I said, that's the way you're going to cut. And I'm going to cut it myself. So I think you know writing is is humble. It's interactive, and uh, you should, uh, after all, as teachers, you know we're always correcting and red circling and whatever. And uh, and I'm pretty, uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm pretty open to people's suggestions about how to make things stronger and uh, and better in writing. There was a question. Well, I got a related question no. to the process. It sounds like you're writing so much, and you have family, and you're out in the field. How do you prioritize? How do you make the time? How do you say no? <laughs> uh, it's a real struggle. Uh, I'm actually on, on leave, sort of, right now, although I've been doing a lot of departmental work for this, for this month. On Friday morning at 5, I'm leaving for South Africa to do some follow-up work on justice and violence there and the Truth Commission. And um, well, how do I handle family? Uh, I invite anyone in my family who wants to come, who can come, to come. <laughs> So uh, my son, who's now 25 years old and uh, working in Boston, and uh, 24 years old, making him older, uh, he says, I'll come with you. And uh, my husband has frequently been with me in the field. Uh, my, my three kids were in Ireland and for much of the time in Brazil with me, although not all of the time. Uh, so we're an anthropological family, like it or not, and we tend to uh, travel together and do things together. Uh, uh, much of the writing of St. Scholars and Schizophrenic was done uh, at the kitchen table at Albany Village with three kids sort of spilling around. And one of the things about uh, having a, a family, fairly large family by our standards here in the academic world, uh, is that it allows me to work with a lot of background noise, even though now they're totally yeah. grown. <laughs> um, so it's a struggle to try to find the time to be a good teacher and a mentor and to be a, a writer. And the added difficulty to be an anthropologist uh, it means going to the field. So there's that extra process. And then, you know, thinking about when you came back from the field, it's not just going to the library. And of course, a lot of people my age don't do this anymore. But I came into anthropology for the love of the field. And I honestly literally get ill if I, if I, if I don't. I mean, I start feeling, uh, I guess, claustrophobic. I've got to get to the field. I've got to be with people. I've got to see what's happening. And also, it's because I tend to go to rural areas, which I love a lot, and uh, where life is very, very different. And uh, uh, I just, you know, I feel I can breathe when I, ever I get back to the town, uh, Bon Jesus de Mata, which is Timbaúba. Um, my good humor comes back. I start laughing because I feel like I'm back in the community where nobody knows me as the professor or the anthropologist. They know me as Nancy, as, and I, they know me as a political person. It's a different part of your personality. They know me as someone who loves the absurdity of everyday life, and so they just can't <laughs> wait to get me involved in the latest absurd plot that's being hatched somewhere. Uh, so I think I consider myself very lucky that I have the opportunity to be a scholar, to be a teacher, to be an anthropologist, to have a family. Um, you don't always do it right. You're, you know, not perhaps as times my children would say I wasn't there for them when I should have been there for them. My daughter is expecting a baby, my eldest, and I've planned my return from South Africa on the day that she's to give birth, 
but she's calling me now and saying, but it may come early. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be in the field. <laughs> so it is, you don't always you know, get it together just right. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was fascinated by St. Scholar and Schizophrenics. I was in Ireland last summer, and people came up to me and started talking about the breakdowns. And there were a lot ah. of people walking around who were, quote, schizophrenic. And they were OK. This was like in Dublin or Sligo, it wasn't in the country. Uh -huh. But it seemed like in that society, they were better off than people here who end up on the street. And really, and then there are people like E. Fuller Tory saying, you know, mm -hmm. involuntary treatment. Do you see some way, you know, between the old fashioned mental hospital and. Oh, the gosh, yes. I, I, in fact, after St. Skulls and Schizophrenics, I went to Boston and did a study of deinstitutionalization of, uh, I thought I was going to be studying an Irish-American community, but South Boston was very diverse, very mixed, and it was hard to know who was Italian, who was Irish, who was Russian, because everybody was sort of mixed in. Um, but it was there that I, I believed that there was an answer to confinement against the will I, I, I'm still very opposed to. Although Stanley Brandis, our chair, has held it against me. He said, Nancy, you were really retrograde in your arguments against mental hospitals, because look at the streets, look what's happened. And I said, but that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't what any of us who were arguing against mental hospitals had in mind. We really believed in the community mental health movement, for example. We really believed there would be alternative structures that weren't going to be um, you know, board and care homes that were really sort of run by penny capitalists trying to eke every penny out of people's welfare checks. I mean, we really thought that there could be something more like the way in more homogeneous, smaller rural communities where the mad circulate, as Foucault would say, more freely in society, and yet people feel an obligation to take care of the person uh, when they can't find food or a place to sleep or whatever. So I had actually written a piece to answer your question called Benevolent Anarchy. And the title, you know, I think put a lot of people off. But it was to say that for specifically thinking about what so-called schizophrenic people, you know, need, they don't always want a lot of interaction with other people. There is a kind of distancing, a kind of uncanny fear of being overwhelmed by people and by ideas and by thoughts. And I think because I don't want to get into the clinical aspects, but certain things are racing for some people and other things are slowed down. So interactions are really hard but that I never knew or worked with a person labeled a schizophrenic who didn't really want some sort of human contact at some, co at some time. And uh, so I suggested that there would be sort of permanent halfway houses of the sort that Franco Basaglia, the radical Italian psychiatrist, when he deinstitutionalized the mental patients in Italy, he uh, didn't force people on the streets of the, uh, I forget, 3,000 people in Trieste or wherever it did in several places. Uh, 2,000 left because they found sort of homes and placements, and 1,000 didn't have anywhere to go. And so he said, okay, once a mental patient, now a guest. Once a mental patient, now a guest. And so you could stay here, but you have your civil rights. Come and go, do what you please. We'll provide meals, we'll provide laundry services. Now that made sense, because there were some people who really couldn't and were frightened. They'd been living in an institution for a very long time, or they really didn't have the minimal skills that they needed. And for them, the, the hospital was all they knew. And so, well, but the hospital itself doesn't have to be a prison. You can have a kind of, you know, we talked about halfway hospitals and things, but we never did it. And, um, you know, I thought that, um, you know, with a lot of input from those patients who were ex-patients who were in a better situation to kind of help. And I also thought of an old-fashioned buddy system. You know, the idea that it, I found, and I'll sort of end here, in South Boston, when I was looking with a, co with a cohort of about um, 50 some odd middle-aged to elderly mental patients who were the last ones let out of Boston State Hospital, many of them had found, co you know, friends in the community. It was the lady that ran the Jolly Donut Shop, for example, who would let people stay in. And it was somebody that ran a wa washeteria and let people sit there. One guy liked to look at the clothes going around and around. And that was fine, as long as he didn't get in with them, you know. There were, there were people who were, there were good landlords who, who really would look in on people. And so what we weren't doing was really finding out who those ordinary people were and not overwhelming them with you know, large numbers, but say, well, maybe you could kind of you know, check in on these five, these six people. 
But I did believe that freedom, I mean, an old anarchist in me, was therapeutic. And I couldn't see that taking away people's rights permanently and putting them in an institution with an undefined sentence, with no way of knowing how to get out, seemed to me to be like no exit. I mean, I, it would be the kind of thing, I guess, that maybe my own, using my own claustrophobia would be something that would just be so alien. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs>